Hello, my name is Jan, and I want to talk about Pyron, an integrated development environment for Up Initial Terminals. So the goal really is to go from the optimistic structure to the full phase diagram using only theoretic predictions. And Pyron should not only be the tool to execute this kind of simulations, but really be an environment where you develop new methods for Up Initial Terminals. The motivation to develop Pyron is really this general fascination about material science. But if I take an element and only a very small concentration of alloying elements, I can get drastically different material properties. Let's take magnesium as an example. Right? Magnesium is a very light material. We would like to use it for many different applications. For example, electric cars, but already at 10% compression, it becomes brittle. But then if we add only like one weight percent of aluminum or in the tenth of a weight percent of calcium, we can get this ternary alloy, which is highly ductile, which can be compressed up to nearly 50%. So this is really the motivation why we want to scan the whole chemical complexity. And in addition, if we look at the phase diagram, so here I have the phase diagram for aluminium and magnesium. On the x-axis, we have the concentration. On the y-axis, the temperature. We can see that for a given concentration, we can have different thermodynamic phases. Right? So we also have to consider the thermodynamic complexity. Combining both, we can easily see that this quickly grows. Right? So we can have like a million uh, experiments that are required to just identify one of these kind of um, new alloying compositions. And while this is impossible on the experimental side, also for the simulation side, it's very challenging to do a million simulations. So Pyron should really be this kind of tool which allows us to address the chemical and the thermodynamic complexity. Talking a bit more about the simulations, I want to show the um, heat capacity here for calcium or for temperature. And we can nicely see that the two theoretical predictions for the LD and GJ functional agree very well with the experimental uh, uh, measurements, right? so the experimental measurements as, as a black symbols. It's a very good agreement for the low temperature FCC phase. And then for the high temperature BCC phase, we see an agreement with the lower branch. And that's really important because the thermodynamic database previously relied on, on the upper branch. And Calford then really uses the kind of heat capacity and other thermodynamic properties of the urinaries to predict the properties of an alloy. And so by showing these results, it was possible to convince them to also update the database. And this really highlights the importance of um, Abinicia calculations, which can not only give qualitatively insights, but really also quantitative predictions. And to explain a bit more about the methods, so, so commonly we use an adiabatic approach, and we really starting uh, to calculate the free energy, we're really starting from the ground state energy, which can be calculated from an energy volume curve, then adding the contribution of the electronic temperature by considering the electronic smearing, um, using finite displacements to calculate the phonons, and then the quasi harmonic contribution to the free energy, and finally the anharmonic contribution. So for the anharmonic contribution, we could calculate this by just using a Molecular Dynamics trajectory, but for computational efficiency, commonly we would just use a short Molecular Dynamics trajectory, fit an interatomic potential, and then use thermodynamic integration from the quasi harmonic to the interatomic potential, and from the interatomic potential to the DFT calculations. So as you can already see, if we go from left to right, where the technical complexity drastically increases, right? we have more and more different codes which have to be coupled together. And that's really the, the challenge um, to develop this kind of complex simulation problems, right? Coupling codes which were developed in different communities, have different input output files, different formats, different variable names, how to store all the data of this kind of complex simulation protocol, and then also build, build feedback loops so the simulation protocol can, can adjust itself. Right? So the challenge of computational material science here is really to, to address the not only the thermodynamic and the chemical complexity, but then also the technical complexity. And we could now do this on the one hand by developing a completely new tool, which only addresses this one application of up initial thermodynamics, or, and that's the, the way I decided to go, we'll develop a framework which then couples existing simulation codes and together to really build this more complex simulation uh, protocols. Really always with a focus, what are tasks that can be automated? Right, so we, we really minimize the input of the user, so the user defines this model, and then the model can, can be validated by specific calculations defined in a project, or written in a generic input, which might, in the case of Pyron, would really be uh, the Python programming language. And the simulation, Pyron takes over, um, converts the generic input to the specific input files required by the simulation code, executing the simulation. This is most likely not on your local computer, but more on a high-performance computer. And then getting returning the output 
again converting the output to the generic format. By using the generic format for both the input and the output, it's possible to really separate the submission of the calculation and the execution from the analysis. So, so the same analysis can be applied to different kind of um, simulation codes. Right? So this analysis would be the validation of the job, maybe the collection of multiple calculations which belong together, and some, some further analysis like, like fitting and, and the volume curve. Finally, the result would be valid, visualized so the user can validate it and maybe update their, their model and do another iteration. So the key part here is really that finally is using this generic building blocks, which can be combined um, just like Lego. You can put one on top of each other to really build complex simulation protocols. And not only build them, but then also they are automated. You can really run them in a parameter story. With Pyro now taking over the technical implementation, so the job management, data management, and the process, we can now really address the, the challenges of these determinants. So here is the evaluation of the partition function. As I already said before, we don't want to do this directly from DFT. A few hours per calculation is simply too long. Rather, we fit an interatomic potential and then use this interatomic potential to evaluate our partition function and calculate the phase segment. Um, to, to highlight how Pyron can be applied to the whole range of, of challenges in Appendage Thermodynamics, I just picked two. So one is the uncertainty quantification for density function theory, and the second is the calculation of, of uh, melting temperatures for interatomic potentials. So really showing that we can cover the, the whole range from ground state DFT calculation up to finite temperature interatomic potential calculation. Starting with the uncertainty quantification in DFT. Um, if we think about a DFT calculation, ideally we would really have like to use an infinite basis set. Right? So then we would only compare our infinite basis set, the, the result there, to, to um, an exponential result, and that would really be our accuracy. But given our limitation and computation time, we only have like a finite basis set. So here this is given by the energy cutoff. Um, and this finite basis set really also limits our precision, as we have really two different ones. The precision is something we can control by investing more computational time. We can achieve a higher precision, while the accuracy is fixed based on the choice of um, certain potential that, that we use for our DFT calculation. And while there's already some general knowledge, for example, for, for the total energy, how it changes if we increase our energy curve and always decreases, there's no such general knowledge about combining properties like the bulk modulus. Right? So the bulk modulus is a second derivative um, by, uh, to, to the, uh, with the volume um, of the total energy. And so basically, this kind of convergence tests have to be repeated for every new material property and also every new material, which is really like a challenging task. Right? So there's a lot of DFT calculation which does these conversion tests. And if we are able to systematically do this on a high precision level in an automated way, that will really be a nice advantage. Um, and what I found there was really that we can use tensor decomposition. Right? So here I show the as a cube, so the k point mesh on one axis, energy curve on another, and the volume depends on, on a third axis. And this cube can really be separated into the four surfaces, two to calculate the systematic errors, and, and then two which are multiplied to get the statistical error. And so the systematic error is basically that the convergence, the, the volume dependence of the Convergence and dependence of the energy cutoff is independent of the K-point mesh, and in the same way, the volume dependence of the convergence of the K-point mesh is independent of the energy cutoff. Uh, so that would be like we can calculate the two blue surfaces; they are similar in the two orange surfaces here. The difference, if we just subtract these surfaces, are just these fluctuations. And as these fluctuations are more or less statistical, we can treat them by just calculating the, the standard deviation and just building the relation of the standard deviation in, term, in, in terms of the, the convergence parameters. Right? And so we, we have this one expression. We start with the energy volume curve at maximum convergence parameters. Then we take the, the systematic contribution for the energy curve, the systematic contribution for the k-points, and finally the statistical contribution. And then we are able to approximate any energy volume curve within the, in the, this cube. Right? So it's really just four surfaces that are required to predict the full cube. So you might ask, how accurate is this method? And to do this, I now really fully calculated all the different energy volume curves and all and, and the whole parameter space. And that's what you see on, on, on the left. So these are really the, the raw results if we do all the calculations. And then on the right, you see the predicted results. So this is using this approximated formula as shown above. And it only requires 4,000 calculations compared to the 50,000 calculations that are required to, to calculate the, the full surface. And we can spot 
very small parts, but it's basically then they are the same. And so what, we, what I showed now was really that we are able to do it in an automated way. Right? So this, this protocol, the tensor decomposition, works in an automated way, and we're able to predict the uncertainty for basically all equilibrium properties. So with this, we can now start and compare different um, elements. And then for the comparison of the elements, rather than looking at the, the individual features of the uncertainty landscape, we really are more interested in like the, the convex hull. Right? So as you, as you see it here, so I show you this for aluminum. And we can see for aluminum, for example, that the systematic error is always like an order of magnitude larger than the statistical error. So the, here, this separation works very nicely. And in contrast to this, for the copper, the, statistic, uh, the statistical error and the systematic error are really on the same order of magnitude. And so we can combine those two in like an error phase diagram. And that's what I show here. And then in this error phase diagram, we can basically, the, the red line denotes the, the error phase boundaries. So where the statistical error and the systematic error are exactly equal. If we go to lower convergence parameters, the statistical error becomes more dominant. If we then go to higher convergence parameters, the systematic error becomes more dominant. And this differentiation is, is really important because the statistical error, given the, the multiplicative conversion uh, as I showed before, can really be uh, improved by only changing either of the two convergence parameters. So either I improve my energy curve or I improve, improve my capable mesh. While for the systematic error, I always do have to improve both convergence parameters right? so, because it's an additive con con convergence here. And so, so the, the error of phase diagram really shows us what kind of strategy I can use to achieve a given convergence goal in the certain region of my parameter space. So with this, so we have our tensor decomposition, the use of the convex hull, and then the uh, error of phase diagram. We are now able to really scan over the periodic table and look at different elements and see how the con convergence con compares. So for example, we find that uh, calcium requires comparably rather low convergence parameters um, to, to already achieve a high precision of like one, uh, 0 0.1 gigapascal. On the other elements, like, like copper, um, this precision of 0 0.1 gigapascal is basically never really achieved. And already for 0 0.5 gigapascal, we need much, more high, much higher convergence parameters than, than for calcium. And then if we go down, so following the periodic table, going from copper to over silver to gold, we can really see that and the required energy cutoff this is decreasing to achieve the same level of precision. And in the same way, if we go from gold over platinum to yttrium, we can see that the required k-point mesh uh, is, is reduced. So to summarize this, um, with the knowledge of the full error surface, we're really able to do accurate uncertainty quantification. But this is only possible by using automated tools like Python. Right, so it's really the, the challenge here to have these tools first be able to develop these new insights. Let me now switch gears and come to the calculation of the melting temperature. And what I, what I show here is the, the volume expansion um, for, for a simula uh, periodic uh, simulation cell with periodic boundaries. So we can see if we increase our uh, temperature, the, the sample remains solid even beyond the melting temperature. And only at the superheating temperature, it becomes liquid. And then if we take our liquid sample, start cooling it, it remains liquid below the melting temperature and only at the supercooling temperature it becomes solid again. So we really have this kind of hysteresis here. And so to address this, what is commonly done is really building a, an interface of a solid and the liquid structure um, in, in a kind of coexistence approach, and then apply different strains along the z-direction to see if, if the interface moves. Um, th this requires a very careful equilibration. Right? So we first have to equilibrate our simulation time, then equilibrate for different strains, and finally repeat the first two steps to really also equilibrate the, the xy direction. And so the, the high precision again leads to rather complex simulation protocols. I again use, use the simulation life cycle as, as discussed before. So the user only has to define the, the element and the interatomic potential and can provide a guess for the melting point. If there's no guess provided, we'll just use the experimental melting temperature. Then the sample is heated. And Pyron automatically checks, does the sample become fully liquid? If this is the case, then we are already beyond the, the real melting temperature. So we do a feedback loop, reduce the guess, and, and start over. In the second step, we, we fix half of the structure, continue heating the other, other half to really form our solid liquid interface. Again, 
we will then check the interface. If the interface is either fully solid or fully liquid, we update the parameters and then start over again. If it's really a solid liquid interface, we can then apply different strains and calculate our temperature over pressure and to truly determine that the melting temperature is at zero pressure. The challenges in the development of this kind of simulation protocol on the one end was to develop a solid liquid detector, which is able to clearly identify the, the boundary of the solid and liquid phase. And because like standard uh, common neighbor analysis or so, uh, still has atoms within the solid phase which are identified as liquid. And the other challenge was really in, in particular in HCP liquid, we had the formation of voids. So this has to be identified to remove these calculations from the um, uh, fitting of the temperature pressure curve. And so, so Byron not only automates this kind of calculation, but it really makes it autonomous calculation. Right? I can give the element and the interatomic potential, and they can forget about it. Byron will continue to run multiple iterations until it really is converged and return the, the full melting temperature. To demonstrate this, I, I used the um, NIST database of so the National Standards for, uh, Institute for Standards and Technology. Uh, I chose roughly 200 potentials. Some of these potentials include multiple elements. So in total, I did over 260 melting point calculations. And that's what you see here. And basically, we, we see the, the melting temperature predicted by the interatomic potentials um, over the experimental melting temperature. And what we can see here is really that there are certainly the, the issues um, for, for a single element, when there are multiple potentials, the error goes up to plus minus 1,000 Kelvin. Right, so this is really that demonstrates that currently the, the melting temperature is not considered in the fitting of interatomic potentials, but it's necessary to include this in with the simulation protocol that I demonstrated. It's not possible to this issue. To now also address the second challenge, so can we predict the melting temperature already from the hysteresis, so from the superheating and supercooling temperature? I now plot for each potentials of over the predicted temperature, melting temperature, I plot the superheating and supercooling temperature, superheating with open symbols, supercooling with closed symbols. From those, we can then calculate the superheating and supercooling coefficient. And what we find there is that the superheating for the BCC phase, which is less closed back than the HCP and FCC phase, it is relatively always lower comparison to the melting temperature um, and for the closed back phases. Right? And now not having this knowledge that it's slower for the BCC phase, we can include this in our reconstruction and really predict the melting temperature already from the superheating and supercooling phase. This method still has an error of plus minus uh, 20%, so that's a, a rather large error, but it's a very efficient way to get a first guess um, of the melting temperature and get a feeling of what's the, the order of magnitude of the melting temperature. Right, so I hope I was able to convince you that with the high throughput capability of, of Pyron, we are able to include this kind of complex simulation protocols and then apply them to really identify um, the, the kind of physical differences so that the BCC phase has a lower overheating temperature relative to the melting temperature. And then again, uh, apply this and then build a, a predictive model to already calculate the melting temperature from the superheating and supercooling temperature. To summarize now, um, I hope I was able to convince you that by addressing the, the technical complexity with a framework like Pyron, we on the one hand enable the rapid prototyping so we can really try out new ideas. We can then take the same simulation protocol, scale it up, which finally enables us to develop uh, new cost grade models. On the one hand, this was our error phase diagram, and on the other hand, the prediction of the mass temperature already from the superheating and supercooling temperature. Beyond um, the application that I showed here, Pyron is also used to compare different methods to calculate phase diagrams and for the validation of interatomic potentials. So there it's particularly useful to be able to run the same simulation protocol for, for DFT calculations and interatomic potential calculations for method development in density functions theory. So for example, the relaxation of, of um, par optimization of, of paramagnetic structures and also beyond the Max Planck Institute. Right? So this is it's used in, in Bochum at the ICAMS and in, in Darmstadt, also national research initiatives like Materials Digital on the NFDE Mudwerk, and internationally at the Los Alamos National Lab, at Skoltech in Russia, at the University of British Columbia in Canada, and the Center for Molecular Modeling in Belgium. And in particular, the people in Belgium also use Pyron, not only for, for their research, but also to teach students um, the, the message of atomistic modeling. Finally, I'd like to thank my 
supervisors, um, Jörg Nagebar and Tom Hickel, the examination board of my PhD defense, the Pyron core developers who joined me in this effort to develop Pyron, my collaborators and the funding, and I thank you guys for listening to me.